Michael Brown is a senior political analyst, analyst for the Washington Examiner and a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where many of our best speakers over the years have come from. He's a contributor to Fox News Channel. He's the principal co-author of the Almanac of American Politics, which is published by National Journal every two years. He's also the author of several books, one of which we have for sale out here this evening, Shaping Our Nation, How Surges of Migration Transformed America and Its Politics. And he will be signing uh, books after the presentation tonight. So if you didn't buy one on the way in the door, you'll still have a chance to buy one um, after the, the presentation tonight. And Mr. Brome will, will, will sign your book. Um, over the years, Mr. Brown has written for many other uh, publications in the U.S. as well as uh, publications uh, in many other countries, including uh, uh, the U.K., writing for the Sunday Times of London and other publications. He has received several awards, including the Bradley Prize from the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, as well as the Barbara Olson Award from the American Spectator. Mr. Brown lives in Washington, D.C. He's traveled to all 50 states, which is only seven fewer states than Barack Obama visited when he was running for president. <laughs> He's also visited, get this, every single one of the 435 congressional districts in the United States. Um, I asked him earlier when he visited the third con congressional district in Colorado, did he come to Steamboat? And he said, no. So we're glad that tonight he's adding Steamboat Springs to his uh, uh, itinerary of places he's visited all around the world, as well as 54 um, other countries. So we are certainly glad uh, that he was able to come to Steamboat tonight. Let's give a very warm Steamboat welcome to Michael Barone. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here in Route County, which I believe is my 1,176th county uh, that I've been in in the United States. I will have to tell you that I do not intend to go to all 3,141. There are a bunch of little counties in the Sandhills of Nebraska that have about uh, 200 people, and uh, it's, uh, it's something that I think is not uh, high on my list uh, to do that. But I'm very pleased to be here in in your beautiful community and uh, to be here at the 1773 Club. Now, hmm, let me think of the reason for that name. Um, <laughs> what happened in 1773? Something to do with coffee, I think. Um, throwing tea bags over the uh, side of the, into Boston Harbor, or whatever. Um, you, you know, the very fact that uh, you're commemorating out here in Route County, something that uh, happened in Suffolk County, Massachusetts. Um, it, it, it's a reminder of how far this country has spread in the last 240 some years, how far across the continent uh, in uh, making its presence known in all quarters of the world, being a force for freedom uh, and democracy uh, throughout the world. We've gone from uh, a nation of three million people on the Atlantic seaboard just starting to penetrate beyond the Appalachian Mountains to a continent-wide nation with a worldwide reach. Um, and I'm also flattered to be uh, here at uh, the site of the Tony Blankley Chair in Public Policy and American Exceptionalism. I mean, I knew Tony as a top uh, as press secretary to Newt Gingrich. Um, you always knew Newt was going to get in trouble making some statement back when he was a speaker when he prefaced it by saying, Tony told me not to say this, but <laughs> that's when Tony, you know, and so forth. And I obviously knew, uh, and, and many times uh, we spent, uh, Tony and I spent on the McLaughlin group um, in, uh, in eternal battle against Eleanor Clift, uh, who was actually a very nice and generous person. Uh, and uh, you know, John McLaughlin, you know, how many of you, you, John McLaughlin basically has figured out a way to make more than a million dollars a year out of having an obnoxious personality. Uh, <laughs> some people think that that personality is put on, that it's an act. <laughs> it's not. He's an obnoxious individual. He's, um, you know, somebody said he saw 
uh, John McLaughlin one day walking his dog. He said he was kicking the dog. <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, Tony uh, has left us, but he's also left us with his book, his 2005 book, The West's Last Chance, where we win the clash of civilizations. Uh, and he was determined to fight back at home and abroad with his 2008 book, American Grit, what it will take to survive and win in the 20th century. Uh, so I think to Tony is a continuing source uh, of wisdom and knowledge uh, about and appreciation of our country. And I think there are some encouraging signs now that the majority of Americans are showing some real American grit in rejecting uh, the attacks on our founding principles uh, in our recent years. Uh, President Barack Obama and the Obama Democrats uh, came to office with super majorities in the Congress, uh, cherishing an assumption that economic distress would make Americans more supportive of or amenable to big government policies. That's a lesson they drew from the New Deal historians, uh, uh, very fine writers like Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., who wrote best-selling books about the Franklin Roosevelt and his administration. That was the lesson they taught. People love big government. Give them uh, goodies and they will be happy and so forth. I argued uh, for a different interpretation of that in my uh, 1990 book, Our Country, The Shaping of America from Roosevelt to Reagan. Uh, it hasn't been quite as influential as Arthur Schlesinger's work. Um, the last time I looked on Amazon.com, a copy was available for 11 cents. <laughs> You have no excuse not to sign up. If you've got Amazon Prime, you're, gonna, you're paying just nothing for this. Um, I made the argument that, um, that Roosevelt was rewarded in the elections of 1934, his first off year in 1936, his re-election to a second term, not so much for his redistribution policies, which had not come into effect at that time but for stopping the deflationary downward spiral or being given credit for stopping it that was really terrifying to people in the Great Depression uh, in the, when em unemployment went up to 25%. And I've noted also in my comms in the Russian Examiner and my work for American Enterprise Institute that when Roosevelt's redistribution policies came into effect in his second term, uh, they proved to be very unpopular. Uh, you had big government uh, expanding in various ways with all sorts of proposals. We were going to divide America up not into states but into river basins. You've had some experience with that in Colorado. Um, you've got, uh, you had a uh, stagnant economy. You had a big recession, 1937. You had uh, uh, businesses weren't creating jobs, the threat of high regulation, high tax rates on high earners combined with the increasing threats of government regulation um, was resulting in a stagnant, no new jobs economy. Does any of this sound familiar? Uh, if you go back and look at the polling in that, and I you know, refer you to the, you take the volume of Gallup polls off your shelf and take a look at the, that period, what you'll find is those policies were unpopular. Roosevelt was headed, in my view, uh, and his party, the Democratic Party, suffered a big defeat in 38 off-year elections. They were headed to defeat in the 1940 election if that election had been decided on domestic issues. But in fact, what happened was that uh, we had a world crisis. By the time summer of 1940, Hitler and Stalin were allies in control of, or threatening to be in control of most of the landmass of Eurasia. Britain was holding out bravely, but uh, by a thread. Uh, there was a real world crisis. Roosevelt was a proven leader, and he basically was ele re-elected that year and again in 1944 as a, um, as a, a, as, as a seasoned leader uh, in time of world crisis, a crisis uh, really much more threatening to, than, than anything we face today. The, the closest thing the world has come to George Orwell's vision in 1984. And the other thing I would say on behalf of President Roosevelt, uh, although I cannot say the same for all of his successors, um, is that uh, he was very good at pe picking people to get things done on things that he considered very important. He made a lot of lousy appointments at things he didn't consider important, but when he wanted things to get done, they got done. Uh, it was during the Roosevelt administration 
that they built the Pentagon. Ground, uh, the, the cornerstone was laid on September 11th, 1941, before Pearl Harbor. Um, and that, uh, it, they've got it built in 18 months. It's still the largest office building in the world. Uh, recently, I live in Washington and travel often to Ron Reagan National Airport, go by the Pentagon on the George Washington Parkway. They were repairing a bridge called the Humpback Bridge over an inlet of the Potomac uh, that's about 30 feet high. Um, that took four years and six months, <laughs> 42 months. From the side of the bridge, you could look and see the Pentagon. There is something wrong with this picture. Um, the, uh, the fact is that government is simply not performing um, the way uh, that it once was capable of performing. Uh, and uh, the American people are coming to realize that. Um, we see uh, one of the things we've been seeing is that uh, President Obama, um, having passed the Obama, what I will call the Obamacare, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, in March 2010, has been suspending the operation of one provision after another, which sort of suggests that the legislation was not too well put together. Um, he, was, uh, he suspended the enforcement of certain immigration laws, uh, declining to uh, defend in court bills uh, signed by Bill Clinton, like the Defense of Ma uh, Marriage Act, granting waivers from the 1996 Welfare Act. Reform Act, also signed by Bill Clinton. Uh, and most recently, we saw him refusing to give 30 days notice to Congress before releasing uh, five Guantanamo uh, detainees. Um, we've had this administration, interestingly enough, has been um, overruled on uh, various policies by the Supreme Court by unanimous nine to nothing votes, including uh, President Obama's own appointees from cases from attaching a GPS device to a citizen's car uh, to imposing $75,000 per day fines for alleged violations of wetlands regulations um, in some place where there was a little pond or something uh, in Idaho, uh, or in, in determining, and they, they said that government can determine who counts as clergy in a religious organization. The Supreme Court, nine to nothing, said, uh-uh, we have something in the Constitution the First Amendment called free exercise of religion. Um, and the government is not going to say uh, how a religion should be run. Uh, and I think, you, you know, we are seeing a reaction of this uh, in the political marketplace. Uh, I'm a, uh, I will admit I'm a recovering pollster. I used to work in the polling business. Um, and one of the things we see is that the president, although he was reelected with 51% of the vote, has been uh, getting job approval now well under 50%, uh, currently at 44%. Uh, uh, if his approval had been that low in November 2012, uh, he would have received uh, not 332 electoral votes, but more like 191, uh, losing just about all the target states, including Colorado. Uh, I think we're seeing a continuing negative response to Obamacare. Uh, speaker, as she then was, Nancy Pelosi, said that Congress had to pass the bill in order to find out what was in it. Um, that apparently is true for the administration as well. Um, the, uh, since they've been suspending uh, various parts of it, uh, current response on Obamacare, 39 percent approval, 51 percent disapproval. Um, that's, uh, a, uh, you know, that's, uh, it is a stark contrast with Americans' reactions to some earlier expansions of government, whether you're talking about Social Security in the 1930s or Medicare in the 1960s, uh, this has had a continuing negative response from the American people. And it is one, I will tell you, that was not generated uh, by and large by uh, my friends in what we like to call mainstream media. Uh, this is something that people have discovered and come to a judgment on uh, by themselves. Uh, and so we've got a, an election cycle where we've got uh, the Democrats are in serious danger of losing their majority in the Senate. We've got uh, serious contests in seven uh, uh, Democratic seats in states that were carried by Mitt Romney. Uh, and we've got serious challenges in seven other Democratic states that were target states or nearly so in the 2012 election, including your home state of Colorado. Uh, we don't know what you know, what, how those uh, 
elections are going to come out. Uh, but there's obviously uh, a very um, good chance that the Republicans will win a majority in the Senate. Most of the analysts think it's greater than 50 percent. Um, and uh, the, um, the uh, House of Representatives seems almost certain to be held uh, by Republicans. Um, they currently have it uh, counting vacant seats, uh, 234 to 201 majority. Uh, and if you go back to the 2012 election, uh, Mitt Romney carried a majority of House seats, 226, to Obama's 209. So that amounts to a rejection. But I think there's something more fundamental that people are rejecting um, than just uh, one political party when we're going through a rough period on some elections. We often see um, the pendulum go back and forth uh, over some range. Uh, I think we're also seeing an awareness that the big government policies, which the Obama Democrats were confident Americans would embrace and were very confident that Americans would meekly accept, uh, are, not, uh, are, are not being accepted and are not being agreed to uh, by a majority of Americans. They're seeing these policies in action. They're seeing the macro economy that appears to be resulting from these policies. Uh, and they don't like what they see. Uh, and I think it's very interesting that there are uh, some books now coming out um, that basically make it very, and not all from partisan Republicans or conservatives, that make an interesting uh, case. You, you have a uh, Yale Law professor emeritus, Peter Shuck, a uh, man who says he's voted for Democratic presidential candidates um, every election since 1972, uh, has a book out, which I referred to in my Washington Examiner column that will be available online earlier, uh, later this evening, um, a book called Why Government Fails So Often. Uh, he's got an interesting passage, which I quoted some things about, arguing that the Veterans Administration was dysfunctional for a number of reasons. This is in a book that came out before the recent revelations about the Phoenix and other VA hospitals and the waiting list uh, uh, falsification scandal. Uh, you've got New York lawyer Philip Howard has got a book called The Rule of Nobody. Uh, about why we can't do things like build the Pentagon uh, in 18 months anymore. And John Micklethwaite, editor of The Economist, and his colleague Adrian Wildridge uh, have a book called The Fourth Revolution, which is about how government, um, the kind of big government, welfare state government that we have is simply not working very well. It's sort of what the political scientist Stephen Tellis says is a kludgeocracy. Uh, and I think um, one of the reasons we can see it, um, compare these times with what big government did under Franklin Roosevelt, I mentioned earlier, whom President Obama sees as an inspiration, although perhaps not as good as he is himself. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it was 42 months from Pearl Harbor to VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. During that time, American government, American business, labor unions cooperating in, in many cases, um, mobilized 16 million men, a few women in the military in a country of 131 million. They sent those people overseas. Uh, we constructed hundreds of naval ships, thousands of airplanes. We supplied food and armaments to our allies, including the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and, and others around the world. Uh, we stormed the beaches in North Africa, in Pacific, one Pacific island after another. The beaches at Normandy, uh, the anniversary of which comes this Friday. Uh, we, we conquered Europe in that time. That's what American government and the American people were able to do uh, in the 1940s, 42 months. Well, it was 42 months from the passage of Obamacare in March 2010 until October 2013, the rollout of Obamacare. They had 42 months, the same time it took us to win World War II. You saw the website. <laughs> uh, uh, this simply, government has taken on more responsibilities. It has generated dozens and hundreds of new programs, and it is performing its basic responsibilities uh, less um, ably uh, than it has in the past. 
Uh, this is partly, I would argue, a matter of personnel. I don't think President Obama has the knack that President Roosevelt showed of picking the right person for the right for what he considers important jobs. Uh, but it's also a question of structure and ideas. And I think that the American people um, are getting the idea that some of these things, uh, that these big government policies, now that they've seen them in action, uh, are not working very well. Now, over the past uh, 20 years, we've seen uh, a sort of political sta uh, stasis, uh, static behavior in partisan terms. Uh, we've seen uh, voters increasingly vote straight tickets. Uh, we have seen, uh, starting in 1992, we have seen Democrats winning four of the last six presidential elections, winning the popular vote in a fifth. But at the same time, <coughs> Republicans have won House majorities in eight of the last 10 elections, starting in 1994. Uh, so we have split party government. Uh, currently, you will hear some people say, well, that just could never work. Uh, the fact is we've had split party government with one party in the White House, another party with a majority in one or both houses of Congress for 69% of the time since 1968. It is not an abnormal condition faced by President Obama. It is something closer to the norm uh, that American presidents, American members of Congress, and American voters uh, have faced. Now, this is, this, we've had, in both cases, close contests. We've had uh, continuing uh, elections decided by relatively close margins. Uh, we've had voting behavior. Um, as I argue in my book, Our Country, American politics has more often split us along cultural issues than on economic issues, though sometimes it does that as well. Uh, and the, the American electorate is split largely. The, the two parties' coalitions uh, are highly correlated with c attitudes on cultural issues. And the demographic variable most highly correlated with voting behavior has been religion or a degree of religiosity, uh, with the more religious within each sectarian group tending to be heavily Republican, the less religious or secular tending to be heavily Democratic. Um, why do we have uh, split party uh, control? Um, it's, uh, you, some people claim that it's partly uh, because Republicans have been more successful in drawing the districts the equal population districts for House of Representatives. There's something to that, but that's a minor effect. The major reason is demographic. Um, we have uh, Democratic voters, heavily Democratic voting groups, blacks, Hispanics, and gentry liberals. I don't know if you, have you heard the term gentry liberal? Uh, think Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> think Aspen. Um, if I could use a dirty word here in Steamboat Springs. <laughs> um, gentry liberals. They tend to be clustered in central cities, in sympathetic suburbs, and university towns. Um, Denver, Boulder, Aspen, and Colorado. While Republicans are spread more evenly around the country. This has favored in the last 20 years the Democrats in the Electoral College because those clusters produce about 170 safe electoral votes for Democratic nominees. That leaves them just 100 short of the 270 majority. Uh, but in equal population districts, Republicans have the advantage. Uh, as I said, Barack Obama carried 26 states and D.C., 332 electoral votes. But with his 51% of the popular vote, he won only 209 congressional districts, fewer than Mitt Romney's 226. Uh, by the way of comparison, eight years earlier, in 2004, George W. Bush, with an incumbent president, re-elected with 51% of the popular vote, uh, carried 255 congressional districts. Uh, he carried 46 more than Obama, uh, compared to only 180 for John Kerry. Uh, and so uh, we have a situation where uh, people are voting straight tickets, but they're getting divided government. Um, I am um, wondering whether or not um, these uh, numbers are going to remain safe and solid for the next uh, 20 years, uh, as they have for the previous 20 years. Uh, and I think it may be, it, it may be helpful 
uh, to look back a long way to see how old political rules can sometimes be overturned and rendered obsolete. Um, I first wrote the uh, co-authored uh, the, the book, The Almanac of American Politics, for the 1972 edition. That was quite a long time ago. I like to say that it's highly unusual for the first edition of a book of this nature to have been written by someone at the age of four. Uh, <laughs> but the... Uh, but back in that period, um, you had, from 1968 to 88, Republicans were winning five of the six, six presidential elections in that period. Uh, and Democrats were maintaining large margins in the House of Representatives and most of the time in the Senate. And the political scientists developed a set of rules. They said that the Republicans had a lock on the presidency and they gave several plausible reasons why this was so and always would be so. And that Democrats had a lock on Congress, particularly the House of Representatives. And again, they gave some plausible reasons why this was so and always would be so. Um, I uh, uh, wondered whether that would always be true. And of course, as it, as it turned out, it wasn't. Uh, you can refute um, those political scientists' laws by just naming two people, President Bill Clinton and Speaker Newt Gingrich, uh, with the Democrats starting a string of winning the presidential elections in 19... Uh, 94 of six presidential elections starting in 92, Republicans beginning a string of winning eight of ten House majorities starting in 1994. Um, but one of the things that's interesting here is that the, the Democratic hold on the presidency is weaker than the Republican hold was in the years 1966 to 68. During those years, Republicans won the popular vote with the presidency by an average of 10% of the popular vote. Big margins. Uh, Democrats, starting in 92, have won the popular vote by an average of only 4%, narrower margin. Uh, in House elections, Democrats, uh, from going back, way back to 1958 through 1992, always won at least 243 seats. That's with 218 being a majority. 243 was their low number. Usually they were up in the 260s, averaging in that much. Uh, 1994, the Republicans have won t uh, eight out of t uh, 10 House elections, um, but their highest number is 242. After, in other words, they've never won as many seats as the Democrats did in their worst year. Uh, so the re Democrats hold in the presidency, the Republicans hold on the House is shakier um, than was the case the other way around in 1968-88. Uh, and I think um, one of the other things that may be changing in American politics is um, the result of demographics and in this case, demographics not working out, perhaps, the way that many people expected. Um, after the 2008 election, uh, I'm sure you heard many people say that, uh, note that President Obama and the Democratic Party uh, enjoyed, you know, we're going to have eternal majorities because they had very heavy support, very uh, lopsided support from two demographic groups which would inevitably grow as a percentage of the electorate from Hispanics, from young voters, the so-called millennial generation. Demography is destiny, they like to say, and that's correct, but only up to a point. It only matters to the extent that one side or the other comes out ahead in the battle of ideas. Uh, a straight line extrapolation from the 2008 election poll does indeed produce uh, doom for the Republican Party with Obama carrying Hispanics 67-31, carrying the millennials, uh, voters under 30, uh, by 66-32. Uh, after that election, I chided the Republicans for having missed um, the uh, chance to win that election by amending the Constitution to raise the voting age to 35, uh, <laughs> and providing that no one under, born after 1980 would ever be allowed to vote. Uh, they missed their shot at that. Uh, but these numbers have been shifting. Uh, Obama did do very well with Hispanics. He did even slightly better with Hispanics uh, against Mitt Romney, 71-27 uh, nationally, and according to the exit poll in Colorado, 75-23 in this state, with Romney carrying whites 54-44. Uh, 
uh, in Colorado. I should add the Colorado exit poll, both in this election and previous ones, I have some questions about. So I'm not sure it's an accurate poll, but that's what it reported uh, in any case. But those things have been shifting as these people are starting to see how these big government and redistributionist policies are working out, what kind of results they seem to be uh, producing. Um, in the abstract, they like, the, if you ask young voters or Hispanic voters in 2008, do you want a big government that does more things or less government that leaves more room for individuals? They were on the big government side by big majorities. Uh, they've had some education since uh, 2008. Um, Gallup, uh, the Gallup poll organization, which conducts multiple interviews over the years, um, took all of its results for 2013 nationally uh, and averaged them together. What they found is that uh, among Hispanic voters, Obama's job approval declined from 75 percent, which it was in the 2012 election day, and that's very close to the percentage of votes that he won from that group of that day to 52%, a bare majority among Hispanics. It declined from 61% to 46% among the millennials. Uh, Pew Research polling recently announced uh, shows that party identification among the youngest millennials, ages 18 to 20, those who have come to age in the Obama years, uh, instead of having a big Democratic majority like the 27 to 29 year olds, uh, it's basically even between the two parties. Uh, and those 18 to 20 year olds, by the way, are a group that includes a higher percentage of Hispanics and blacks than does the population as a whole. Uh, I think that's, that's an interesting uh, bit of fragmentary evidence uh, that the Obama um, uh, years have not been good for big government policies for these segments of the electorate. Um, and I guess I should amend my constitutional amendment proposal to provide that people at, born after 1980 can't vote, but people vote, born starting in 1991 can. Uh, we'll just leave that uh, one uh, decade's uh, uh, birth cohort out of the voting. Uh, and I think the reason it's not hard to see. The Obama Democratic policies have not worked well for these two inevitably larger, increasingly large blocks of the electorate. Uh, Obamacare imposes higher health insurance premiums on those under 35 to subsidize those age 50 to 64. It requires that policies only cost three times as much for the older age group as the younger age group. This, this is supposed to be progressive politics. You're, people under 29 have negative net worths. They have credit card debt, they have higher education debt, uh, and so forth. Uh, they don't have, you know, uh, they haven't, uh, their mortgages have their houses haven't gone up above, the, their, if they have a mortgage, they're probably underwater. So they have negative net worth. People age 50 to 64, you can see this in the Federal Reserve figures that come out on wealth. That's the peak wealth years for people. People start spending down their wealth after age 65. So this is supposedly progressive policy. It takes away from people with negative net worth and gives to people with peak net worth. That's a little wacky, and if you're a young person, you might figure out that this is actually not a good deal. Um, this is, uh, you can pay $2,000 for a health insurance policy that you don't really think you need. Um, you're not allowed to buy the kind of catastrophic policy that makes sense for people that, uh, in, that, in, that in that age group, um, or for many people in that age group. Uh, I asked a White House, uh, leading White House advisor at our American Enterprise Institute World Forum about this, um, and uh, I said, why do, you, why do you have the policy, you know, have, have people with negative net worth subsidize people with positive net worth? He said, well, we thought more about the people we were benefiting than the people that we were uh, hurting. Well, maybe you should sort of think about everybody <laughs> when you're putting together a policy. Uh, and you're throwing out goodies to people uh, you don't know. Uh, Hispanics, um, who has suffered more from sluggish job creation? Who has suffered more from uh, housing, uh, the collapse of the uh, subsidized housing uh, uh, bills and, and so forth that one has to admit was a, to a considerable extent a bipartisan policy? Uh, if you go back and look at the realty track numbers for the years 2007 to 2010, where were the most foreclosures? 
uh, they give you the numbers by county, and you can see where they are. They're in the Los Angeles Basin, the Inland Empire to the east. They're in the Central Valley. They're in Phoenix, Arizona, Metro Phoenix, Metro Las Vegas. They're in Orlando, Florida. My estimate is that one-third of the people that got foreclosed on were Hispanics. They were told that big government is going to help you accumulate wealth by making you a homeowner. It turned out that policies which encourage cheating, which encourage misstatement of earnings, uh, which encouraged uh, giving uh, loans to people that did not meet ordinary credit worthiness standards, those policies hurt the people that they were their intended beneficiaries. Uh, and that's been one of the major trends. We've seen, by the way, no net migration from Mexico to the United States between 2007 and at least 2012. Later figures are not available. Um, I think that what's happened is that these, some of these people had a dream of accumulating wealth in the United States. That dream was shattered by um, bad public policy, uh, bad government policy. Um, college loans. Uh, once again, we've had, and there's some bipartisan support for this, we've had policies over the years attempting to subsidize and encourage college loans. Well, what has happened to that, uh, those colleges and universities? How many of you have seen the figures for the, F, the rise in tuitions from the night college and university tuitions from the 1970s today? How many have seen the diagrams? It goes up faster than everything else, including open heart surgery. Um, what, who benefits from this? Well, administrative bloat. There are now more college and university administrators than college and university teachers. There is something wrong with this picture. Uh, there is something wrong with the way that we've, we've attempted with um, generous spirit to aid young people. What we've got now is that there is more college loan debt out there than there is credit card debt. Um, <clears throat> this is an amazing statistic. And of course, uh, not all uh, these people uh, with the sluggish economy we've had, people, even those who graduate, certainly the many who don't graduate, uh, are, are in bad shape, uh, they are not finding jobs. They're working uh, in low-paying jobs uh, because there aren't high-paying jobs available. Um, so young people as well as Hispanics have suffered this. And then the final indignity, Obamacare. You think the Obamacare website was bad? the one in English. Try the one in Spanish. That was totally inoperative for two months. And I am told by people familiar with the Spanish language that it turned out to be written in a sort of Spanglish. Uh, they didn't know how to use words good. Um, <laughs> and it's just, you know, government don't work good. Uh, it's not working well for these people. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, the, the Obama Democrats uh, thought that Hispanics, millennials, would embrace the idea that a competent, caring, big government would protect them against downside risk and so help them achieve upward mobility. But that simply hasn't turned out to be the case. It has not protected them against downside risk, and it has not helped them achieve uh, upward mobility. Um, it has shown big government to be about, in the United States, to be about as competent and caring as big government in Mexico. And that's not a really high standard. It's not the one that our founding fathers had in mind. Um, and uh, it's not clear um, that, uh, that these policies have worked to the benefit. And I think there is a uh, serious risk of erosion of support for the president and his party among two groups of the electorate that they have been counting on to deliver uh, for them uh, perpetual uh, national um, majorities. Um, and so um, that's, uh, I think, one of the results. We've seen big government in action. Uh, we've seen uh, that, that, uh, that it doesn't work very well for the people that it's intended to work, that you basically um, have uh, a, a government that's not performing ably. Um, we used to have a government that could build the Pentagon in 18 months and win World War II in 42 months. We now have a government that took 42 months to build the humpback bridge, 
uh, and couldn't b build a website in 42 months. Um, where will this lead to the future? Well, as I said, we, we had that one period of apparent continuity in presidential and House races, 68 to 88, let's say. We've had another period of continuity, 1992, 2012. There are certainly plausible reasons for thinking that, that something like that continuity will continue. People have been voting straight tickets. They seem to be pretty, uh, um, uh, most people seem to be pretty much on the side of one party or the other. They may call themselves independent, but they don't tend to vote that way. Uh, so I think it's entirely possible as we look ahead past 2014 to 2016 uh, that we'll see another uh, election of that sort um, and so forth. Um, but I think that there are two other alternatives which I consider uh, tantalizing and interesting uh, that may change. I'm, I'm always try to be on the lookout for how things can change as well as how they can stay the same. I guess that's partly a professional interest. If they stay the same, my speeches get kind of boring, at least for me. Uh, if they change, it gets more interesting. Uh, but two alternatives are conceivable. One you can extrapolate from current uh, polling is a, um, is a victory for Hillary Clinton for president in 2016. She's well, running well ahead of President Obama's job approval, running ahead a little over 50 percent, not quite as much, and so forth. You've got some Clinton fans carrying, uh, saying that uh, she's going to win 45 states. That's uh, Bill Clinton never carried more than 32. Um, I'm not so sure of that. Uh, certainly, that's a possibility. Uh, but there's also some reason to believe that, uh, that Clinton's current positive standing may not uh, endure. Um, for one thing, uh, President Ob the Obama foreign policy has now got negative uh, uh, ratings from the public. I mean, the Obama people say, hey, look, they wanted us to get out of Iraq, we got out of Iraq. They wanted us to get out of Afghanistan, we're getting out of there. Uh, we'll give them five Taliban people for one possible deserter um, the, so we can get out. Um, the, um, but, the, uh, but, the, but people don't like the results. The world is in disarray. You've got China advancing. China and Russia now made that big uh, $400 billion natural gas deal. That's sort of, you know, uh, I mean, Henry Kissinger... Uh, and Richard Nixon engineered an opening to China, which lasted for a long time, about 40 years ago, and I guess it may just have lasted about 40 years, and now China and Russia may be getting back together again. That's not a happy situation. Uh, she's entitled uh, her recent autobiographical book, Hard Choices. Hard Choices suggests that she's not so much making a positive case for herself as saying, gee, we did the best we could in difficult times. That's not perhaps the most inspiring appeal that a candidate for office can make. You know, things are crummy, but uh, they, they might have been somewhat worse. Um, <laughs> she also apparently uh, leaves out her eight years of service in the Senate. Well, what was she doing there? She's written a book uh, after uh, the Clinton presidency about her years up to uh, being first lady in the 1990s until 2001, her 13 days in which she was both first lady and junior senator from New York. Um, the, uh, but she hasn't done, she's leaving out. So I suspect that there's uh, something possibly fragile there. The other uh, possibility uh, is uh, something rather different. If you look at, uh, the, there, there have been a few polls that have uh, tested um, Joe Biden. Many of you will remember him. Uh, <laughs> against possible Republican candidates. Uh, Biden gets only about 34% of the vote in those polls. That's well under Barack Obama's job rating. Now, it may be that some people couldn't respond because they were laughing too much, but I mean, <laughs> um, it's an interesting thing. But one possibility is, uh, I think, a Democratic collapse on the order of if not as great a magnitude as that, of the 1920 election. Now, most of you weren't around for the 1920 election, I'm thinking. Uh, but that was, uh, you know, that was after eight years of Woodrow Wilson's presidency. You remember Woodrow Wilson? 
He, like Barack Obama, spent most of his adult life in it, living in academic communities. He, like Barack Obama, went to Europe and was cheered by mass crowds as the savior of the world uh, and the avatar of peace. Um, he had, in his last two years, more disasters on his watch than uh, Americans have faced in recent times. Great economic uncertainty, uh, waves of strikes, terrorist bombings at uh, home. Um, you had uh, uh, the rejection of, the, of, of his Versailles Treaty and so forth, but basically Warren G. Harding uh, won 60% of the vote in the Democratic ticket of James M. Cox and a young man named Franklin D. Roosevelt won 34% uh, in 1920. Um, could something like that happen? Could the bottom drop out for Democrats? Well, perhaps. Um, if they don't get the kind of turnout that they got from, and percentage that they got for blacks when the first black president was running in 2008-2012, if Hispanics and millennials are no longer giving them the kind of majorities they did in 2008 uh, and to a lesser extent 2012. Um, and I think uh, it also depends on Republicans uh, coming up with some policies that address what regular Americans are facing today. And I note with interest uh, some of these Republican reformers, including some Tea Party favorites uh, like Mike Lee, uh, Senators Mike Lee and Ted Cruz. Uh, you've got uh, young writers like uh, Yuval Levin and Ramesh Panuru uh, in this YG network, uh, e room to grow. Um, Republicans, for a long time, their answer on economics was cut tax rates on high earners like Reagan did. Well, tax rates on high earners were a lot higher when Reagan came in. His, he had more leverage to do so. Uh, that was the, it, those were the issues of 1979 to 81. We're looking at issues uh, uh, 35 um, years later in a different America with a different uh, time uh, zone. And I think uh, Republicans have an opportunity to make the case that the government has grown bloated and ineffective at the same time, uh, that the social engineering policies, which are said to make life fail safe, in fact, turn out to be in practice, turn out to be sure to fail. I think the current breaking scandal of the Veterans Administration makes a point that penetrates beyond party lines. Uh, here's a government service that uh, has beneficiaries that everybody agrees uh, are entitled to some benefit. Uh, but the big government policy is not delivering that benefit. Uh, there must be other ways that will do it better. Centralized command and control, in my view, is a product of the industrial age, the era of mass production. It simply isn't working in the information age, the era of free-flowing information. And I think that it's particularly not working for our younger voters, for our Hispanic voters, and many of them are tilted in age group to younger voters, uh, who want to make their way forward. They are a generation that wants to personalize their world. They have their own Facebook pages, their own, you know, I used to say their own iPod list. Now the iPod is so old fashioned. Um, <laughs> playlists and so forth. They customize their world. Centralized command and control, one size fits all, big government policies, I have been arguing since December 2008, is out of sync with people who want to live that way. A, a overly bloated government policy that stifles economic growth and investment works against young people who want to make their way in forward in the world um, by making sp a particular use of their special talents, their special interests, their individual character, the things they really care about. In an affluent society, all sorts of opportunities for things like that open up. In a bureaucratic, stagnant society, uh, they have not been opening up. So I think there's a path forward um, for uh, Americans. I think Republicans are struggling to come up with some policies that plausibly address this situation. They certainly have not fully gotten there yet. Uh, but I think the, uh, the last um, uh, five years have demonstrated that the big government policies, which perhaps in some ways worked in the 1930s and 40s, 
but which are out of sync with the ideals of our founding fathers and out of sync with the information age are not working now and that the Americans, majority of Americans may well be ready for an alternative. Thanks very much and let's have <laughs> questions. How do you like to do question and answer? Okay. Oh, I'm a klutz with machines. Having said that, oh God, I'm going to dismantle the whole thing. I mean, I'm a real klutz. I have a television set that I wasn't able to turn on for two weeks. I like, you know, in the 1950s we had a TV and you could you turn one knob and it took a little while and sometimes the, the picture flickered but the TV came on. Now I have two remote controls with a total of 96 buttons, and the TV won't come on. Progress. Okay, do we have I gotta, I've got to invite an 18-year-old over to do that. Does anyone have a question? I thought we had one back here. Over there, okay. My question to you is, there are many of us that are, represent the middle class and that feel that we are um, fiscally conservative and yet um, socially liberal. And that goes to what our forefathers were initially, protecting the weak, protecting the indigent, and my question to you is, do you see any opportunity in the future for a party that represents many of us, most of us, um, including the Latino, including uh, most of the um, individuals that represent the middle class today? Well, the middle class in Americans often extends uh a far distance in society. I mean, the late Catherine Graham, the owner of the Washington Post, once was asked if she was upper class, and she said, no, she was middle class. She admitted to upper middle class. I mean, she'd been raised in a mansion with 40 rooms, okay, <laughs> and, and so forth, and purchased her first house with her husband in 1945 for $125,000, which was actually a lot of money for a house in 1945. But uh, so most people think they're middle class. You know, you have permutations and combinations of, you know, let's say left on economic issues, right on economic issues, left on cultural issues, right on cultural issues, or whatever adjectives you want to use to describe it. Uh, and we have a political system that has institutional features, the Electoral College and the single member district, which moves us very much towards a two-party system, um, and, and powerfully so. I mean, a century ago, there were three parties in the United States running in most congressional districts, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and the Progressive Party. The Progressive Party it had in 1912 one of the most popular politicians in American history, Theodore Roosevelt, is his presidential candidate, one of the most vivid and uh, intellectually able. Uh, by 1918, the Progressive Party was basically gone, except as a regional party in Wisconsin with cognates in Minnesota and North Dakota. Germano, Scandinavian America, in my book here. Uh, so the answer is that um, there's no one quarter of those quadrants you can make up that, that, that is a majority by itself. Parties are always um, amalgams uh, to varying extents, uh, with the Democratic Party tending to have more um, sort of distant wings. I mean, if you look at the exit polls from 2008 and 2012, Obama carries the highest incomes and the lowest incomes. Republicans carry the middle. Uh, not by a large margin in any case, except when you get to the very lowest income level, but which is a diminishing percentage of the population. But it's um, it, it you know it's hard there. I think one of the th as I mentioned, our political coalitions now look like they're aligned with an issue like abortion, on which interestingly enough American opinion has been static 
for at least 30 years. Uh, we are not ready as a country to majorities, large majorities oppose the criminalization of abortion. Large majorities favor restrictions on abortion which are greater than those um, that have at least until recently been the law in most states which are in some cases have been disapproved by the courts. Um, and which in some cases are less restrictive than the restrictions on abortion in, um, in Europe. I mean, it, you know, there was a big hubbub among the feminist circles about uh, the, attempt, the ultimately successful attempt in Texas to pass a law preventing abortions, af uh, barring abortions after the 20th week in pregnancy. Uh, there's only one small country in Europe where you can get a legal abortion after the 20th thing. That's progressive Europe, okay, that a lot of people hold up as, gee, they're so much more advanced than we are in their cultural ideas. Um, we basically reached a static position. I think voters are maybe prepared to move on. If you listen to political debate, it is less, and including in the party primaries, about abortion, on which opinion has remained static, on which, if anything, the millennial generation is slightly more favorable towards restrictions on abortion, but not criminalizing it, than their elders. It's a sonogram generation. Um, then, uh, whereas same-sex marriage, huge changes in attitude, which was, you know, a 10% issue back when Bill Clinton signed the Defense of Marriage Act in 1996 in the still of the night. Uh, and uh, is now many polls favored by majorities of Americans, legal in, I guess, 13 states recently, and many states uh, would vote for it today. So um, I think the, that, the, that issue is sort of going out of national politics and being settled more locally and in one direction. Um, and at least so far, I think that people, uh, many people who have tended to oppose same-sex marriage, um, basically are, are having a hard time finding out how it's harming people where it exists. We'll see how that unveils, how that rolls out. Um, but I think big government, when you listen to political dialogue, when you listen to voters' complaints, big government, the macro economy, those are the things that we're talking about, and that's included to a considerable extent in the 2012 Republican presidential primaries, and I would expect that to be even more the case in the 2016. And if, you know, an issue that has been a defining issue of partisan allegiance from in that 1992 to 2012 issue sort of disappears from people's radar screen as an important issue, as an issue that needs to be nationally settled. Um, other issues will come forward, uh, you know. The parties were not aligned along the abortion issue in the 1970s when the Supreme Court decision of Roe v. Wade came down in 73. They were split all over the place, both Democratic and Republican parties. Uh, then they aligned along that issue. I think we may see more of an issue. Uh, I think to some extent it depends on whether or not uh, Republicans, and perhaps some Democrats, are able to come forward with proposals that sound like a plausible and workable alternative to the current kludgeocracy, which will enable people to move forward in their lives in the ways they want to, in the ways that suit their special interests and their special talents and the things they have specially to contribute. So I'm looking for that to happen, but I don't, I, it hasn't happened yet. Maybe it's happening in the process. Let's see, we've got somebody next to I uh, have a question, and okay. this may be unfair because you're not from Colorado. It has, our state has been referred to as a test case for some of the legislation that has gone on. Yeah. We passed some gun laws a year ago that the sheriffs are going crazy trying to enforce. We passed, we legalized marijuana, and there is the potential that we're going to see some anti-fracking measures for energy development on the ballot this fall moratorium types of issues. Do you have any comments or observations about what you see going on here? I'm not going to tell you what I plan to smoke later tonight. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I'm actually not a marijuana smoker, but the, uh, I know adults who are. It's curious. I wouldn't have thought so. But um, the, um, 
well, Colorado is an interesting laboratory, and you've been, you know, you la you had conservative ideas like the Taxpayer Bill of Rights in the 1990s that placed limits on government spending, which prevented Colorado from becoming a California state, uh, plucking the golden goose naked. Uh, you had, you know, that group of liberal uh, zillionaires, including Congressman Jared Paulus from Boulder, uh, who put through some of their ideas and who were trying on some of these other things, the fracking uh, people, and, you know, you get to the crackpots like Bill McKibben that would like us all to live on, you know, a diet that's going to sustain about one billion of the seven billion people on Earth. Um, the, um, you know, so... Uh, I think it's interesting. You know, this state is, it's been reasonably, uh, you know, uh, typical of the nation as a whole. It, what, what, 52 46 for Obama last time when he won 51 47, so you were a point off. Uh, and I think a point off in 2008, or two points off. Uh, you do have one peculiarity here you are the least obese state <laughs> in America. Uh, you will be appalled if you go to some other states and look around at the folks in the malls. Uh, I attribute this in part to the fact that a majority of people in Colorado live at 5,000 square feet or higher in altitude, and that it takes more energy to get out of your car and walk into the mall <laughs> in Colorado than it, you burn up more calories than you do in the flatlands. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm watching with interest uh, what you're doing, and um, I guess would like to learn more about, you know, how you regulate marijuana. On cultural issues, I think that, and this is responsive also to your question as well, in some ways we're moving towards a more libertarian nation on a series of issues that have been identified in some cases with the political right and in some cases with the political left. Um, and, um, you know, instead of abortion, I would say marijuana legalization. That clearly, you know, there was a flurry of interest in, in the early 70s. California voted about 36, 38 percent for it in 1972. Then support went down uh, when crime went up and drug-related crime went up. Perhaps that was the reason. Now it's clearly on the rise. Uh, we've got same-sex marriage. I've mentioned how opinions have changed on that more drastically or greater quantities of people than um, than any other issue. Uh, I'm, in fact, I'll poll this group as a recovering pollster. How many favor same-sex marriage in this room? What's the other choice? Uh, oppose same-sex marriage. <laughs> okay, well, I've sparked some interesting discussions later in the evening. Uh, the, um, I always begin by observing that almost all people on both sides of the issue start off believing that their view would be best for the country and for uh, people, and that sort of tones down the conversation, perhaps. The other one is gun rights. Now, if you go back to the 1950s, when I was a kid, marijuana was illegal. Homosexual acts were illegal. People went to jail for that. Uh, and uh, there were majorities in America for handgun ban. Gallup polls. That was a low crime America. Um, now we're more libertarian. Most Americans favor gun rights, favor same sex, favor. We've got 49 or 50 states which have uh, carry concealed weapons licenses available to response, people who can demonstrate that they're responsible adults, uh, and marijuana. What do all these things have in common? On the one hand, they're a liberation liberation from old rules and old mores. The other thing, though, is that they demand a certain level of responsibility from the individual. Marijuana usage. You've got to cope with the issue of how do you deal with driving under the influence of marijuana. Uh, we've had a great move in our country towards uh, delegitimizing and ending drunk driving or, you know, drinking uh, after, or having uh, driving after imbibing any alcohol. Um, that's a big change in our society. So, yes, you're free to use marijuana, but we've also got to figure out ways to be responsible. Same-sex marriage. Marriage carries the idea of responsibility. I mean, that's why Andrew Sul the argument that Andrew Sullivan and Jonathan Rauch, who are to varying degrees conservative or moderate, uh, argued for same-sex marriage. 
it implies that no, you're not liberated just to do anything you want sexually. There's love, honor, and obey. Or I don't know which way obey go thrust, but anyway. Uh, and so forth. Uh, there are responsibilities in marriage, financial, not just financial, but personal responsibility, and gun control. You've got to demonstrate that you're able to use those, uh, use those weapons safely. You've got people uh, are responsible for, for their usage thereof. And we recognize that there are limits on it. So it's interesting. In those ways, we've become more left-wing and more right-wing, depending on the issue. But in all three cases, we've become, we've liberated people, but also are in the process of imposing responsibilities on them. It's interesting. Okay, this will be the last question so that we have time for the book signing, so. I can talk and sign books at the same time. First, first of all, thank you. Don't, for, don't chewing gum, however. First of all, thank you very much for being here tonight. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I'm a conservative, and your concluding remarks, and, and I am despondent over the progression of lack of, free, or loss of freedom in our country. So your, your concluding remarks tonight gave me some encouragement about the new young generation being unwilling to be herded into, you know, everybody's the same kind of mentality. What can conservatives do to capitalize on that and perhaps reverse some of the, what I consider to be damage? Well, um, what can I say? Uh, one of the things they can do is to come up with some policies that seem to make sense as a way to help people move themselves forward in the direction they want to go um, and to uh, develop those. I think uh, conservatives and Republicans are some distance away from doing a satisfactory job of that at present, but they also have some time. They've got a favorable election cycle probably this year. Uh, and they've got time between now and 2016. They have a whole gaggle of candidates, and um, you know, um, you know, we're, we're still looking for Lincolns and Washingtons in their number. Um, but I think in some ways we may have gotten a little tired, and perhaps we should have looking for Reagans. But Reagan, Reagan was a great president, but he was a president of his time, of his career. I wrote a long article in the Washington Examiner. Uh, available on WashingtonExaminer.com on uh, a kind of a reassessment of Reagan 10 years after his death, 20 years after his withdrawal from public life, 30 years after his uh, re-election, landslide re-election, the last president to be re-elected. But I think, um, I think we, you know, you have to learn to speak in the language of, of younger people. And as a guy who wasn't able to turn on his television, I'm not perhaps the best person <laughs> to advise you how to do that. Uh, but I think, I think it's important to learn the different languages. One of the things that Ronald Reagan had at his disposal that no presidential candidate since has had, no major politician has had, is that he came out of and personified and exemplified and believed in a universal popular culture that used to exist. It existed in the radio starting in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. It existed in the movies in the 1930s and 40s. It existed in television in the 1950s and 60s. And Reagan, in act in his farewell address uh, from the White House, uh, it's interesting to go back and read that text, which I quoted in my article. He talks about how um, show business, it doesn't have the right kind of patriotism anymore. Uh, he's referring to the fact that we don't have that universal culture. Some of those, you know, 1940s movies still convey an idea of what it means to be an American, of an Americanness that um, is still with us today, even though the feminist movement hadn't come in full flower and we still had racial segregation in the South in the 1940s and nasty system and so forth. Um, they still convey that idea. Why do we have universal? Because there were few outlets. There were only, you know, two or three radio networks. There were four or five Hollywood studios, and they owned the theaters through the 1940s, most of them. There were three television networks. The commercial premium was by producing an entertainment product that appealed to everybody, that was suitable for families, that would appeal to adults as well as children. Reagan made his living entirely until he became a political figure 
in universal media, starting off with radio. He listened as a boy to the Chicago radio stations in the 1920s. He was 100 miles west in Dixon, Illinois. Chicago had clear channel radio, and Chicago was the most innovative radio thing. So he was at the heart of this media, universal media, from age 11. He made his way up as a radio announcer. He wangled a, 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 a interview with a Hollywood studio, became a movie star, became a television personality. He made his whole living. He spoke naturally in the language of that. If you go back and watch his Morning in America um, commercial from the 1984 uh, convention, it is still speaking in that universal language. You see the opening is San Francisco Bay. You'd never see that in a Republican ad today. San Francisco is enemy territory. Uh, the next thing is a marriage, an old grandmother cuddling a bride. Well, are you attacking same-sex marriage? You're saying there's something wrong with it? Yeah, controversy. Let's avoid that one. They raise the flag a lot. Um, they've got, then they've got a shot of the Capitol, all those nasty congressmen in there. Um, but that was, you're still speaking language universal culture. That doesn't exist. We have, you know, 227 cable channels. People have their own niche media. Uh, I've never heard most of the music on the radio stations as I click through to try and find a classical station on my drive up here. Um, you don't, um, you know, uh, nobody speaks that universal language anymore. And uh, I think that we have to learn to speak in other languages, uh, whatever positions we're taking on issues, and to uh, try and figure out more about how to speak to people who are from different parts of America, who choose different entertainment, who have different cultural references uh, from those that we're familiar with. Some of us are old enough to remember that universal culture, but uh, it simply uh, isn't, there's not much of it being produced anymore as Reagan lamented in January 1989. Thanks very much.